Hi, this is Dave Lee, aka Jerry Negro, and I'm here to talk about my new album, which is called Remix of Love, Volume 2. Uh, Remix of Love, Volume 1, came out a couple of years ago, and that included my remixes of songs like uh, Patrice Russian, Haven't You Heard, Roxy Music, Same Old Scene, and they were all remixed from the multi-track. The multi-track is like the original 24 track, or sometimes two 24 tracks, 48 track tape, which is um, how music was recorded, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, recently we've gone more digital. But a lot of re mixes or re-edits which are done now tend to be just done from the record. Someone puts the record in Ableton, levels up the tempo and they can add drums, they can beef it up a little bit but I wanted to do these remixes actually using the tape because that means I can do a much more radical remix. I, I can isolate things like strings or vocals which just weren't on their own in the original. So the first album happened because I had a friend who was working in Warner Brothers and I managed to get some tape copies of things like, as I mentioned, uh, Patrice Russian, but also mass production, clear. And I paid for them to be digitized and I was just doing it as a treat to myself. I think it was around the time of my birthday and I thought there's nothing better for me than hearing the multi-track of a song I love. I, you know, I've heard the record, you know, thousands of times and being able to sort of like hear the component parts, hear the drums, the keyboards on their own and, it's, it's one better than having the test pressing or the, you know, the promo or whatever, it's actually having the multi-track. So it's just, it, the, my initial reason for getting them wasn't to remix them, it was just to, to have them and listen to. But then once I actually got them, then I, I, I started thinking, well, I wouldn't mind actually doing a mix of this because it's, it's, it's a great piece of music. And it's something which maybe I just use for my DJ sets. But once I'd done a few of them, I started thinking, well, it'd be great if I could actually release these because, um, I don't know, you spent a lot of work, time and work on them and I don't know, it's, it's just nice if you've done something which you're pleased with, if you want to get it out there into the, uh, into the world. And I thought, I don't want to do these as bootlegs or you know, just put them out as vinyl only things. I want to try and do it legally. For the second volume, my friend had left Warner Brothers so I couldn't get more tapes from Warner Brothers. I thought, well, how am I going to do a new album? There is actually quite a lot of multi-tracks in circulation amongst a certain few people. Those multi-tracks are things that have normally been remixed before or been part of remix projects. For example, the Ashford and Simpson album, which I did a remix for, or the Donna Summer album. These remix albums, the parts have been digitized and they just end up, the person who did the remix ends up letting somebody else have them. And there's quite a big amount of multi-tracks which are kind of, not that you couldn't just, go onto the internet and download them but if you know the right people and you've got something you can trade with them then you you know you can get some some things it's surprising what's out there some some tracks have been on video games there's a, 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 a game called uh, I think it's called Rockstar or something like that I've probably got the name wrong because I'm not really a video game guy but that had um, quite a lot of parts on so they've sometimes bounced to stems and maybe also there's been remix competitions so you know which unless you're a Talking Heads fan or a New Order fan you wouldn't necessarily know that there's a remix competition but there's, it's amazing what's out there but I didn't want to use those I thought well let me just try and do a load of mixes of stuff that's never been remixed before not things that have already been on a couple of remix albums or been part of competitions I want to just go straight to the major labels and say we want to license these songs and remix them I'll pay for these tapes to be digitized um, I'll cover all the costs, you get the remix at the end of it, but we just get to release it once on our album. And generally, they haven't got a problem with that, in theory, but they don't know actually who would be the person I would deal with. So why don't you try, you know, Neil in the US who deals with sort of, I don't know, licensing, or it could be with um, tape copying, and he'll say, yeah, I can do that, but before I do it, I need a RSA form filled out and I said well where do I get one of them from he goes oh you need to speak to Barbara back in the UK and then you speak to Barbara and Barbara says oh actually no I don't deal with that so you're just going round in circles and sometimes you'll get sent back to the person you were speaking to six weeks ago who says oh actually maybe you should speak to so it, it, it's just the the process of doing it is long-winded because they don't do it very often and I guess if they don't know how to help you, 
the easiest way is just to ignore you because it's just it's they don't know really what to say so it's sometimes you have to be quite tenacious and keep re-emailing people or calling them up and cc'ing other people eventually we did get somewhere and you know, I started speaking to someone who could help me, but then that person goes quiet. <laughs> then he steers you to someone else. But eventually you do start to get somewhere. And it was a question of like saying, look, I'll pay for these multi-tracks to be digitized. You've just got them on two inch tape, which I can show you a two inch tape here. So here's, a, here's an old track I remixed years ago, Al Green, Keep Pushing Love. That's what a two inch tape looks like. Unless you've got a tape machine, a two inch tape playing machine, you can't actually use that. So what to, to get it, so that I can play it in here, it needs to be digitized. So it needs to be put on a two inch machine. Sometimes it needs to be baked first because some tapes, if they're old, they've deteriorated and you, they put them in an oven and uh, they bake them and then they'll play okay again, sometimes only once or twice. So you need to copy it when, you, when, you're, when you're sort of baking it or after you've baked it. But so that goes from the two inch tape into a computer there. So they've got the old music preserved in, in a sort of um, digital format, which is better for everybody. I mean, people sometimes say to me, oh, why don't you remix that? Why don't you remix that? It's not a question of like, I can just call up EMI and say, oh, send over the tapes for whatever this afternoon. It's, there's a lot, of, a lot of hoops to jump through. And also a lot of songs aren't available. It's not like every song that has ever been recorded, there's one of these two inch tapes for. A lot of them have been lost. You know, things get left in recording studios. People just didn't think necessarily anyone was going to want them. So there's much more chance of a major label having it than there is maybe something that was, you know, a one-off on, on an independent. But even in a major label, they've probably got maybe about 50%, maybe even less, just for reasons that is just not... Those things, if you've got a lot of them, they're quite a, a big thing to store. It's supposed to be in a room that doesn't get too hot or too cold. So. A major label can afford to have this big building they keep tapes in, whereas um, you know a lot of independents, it wasn't maybe a priority. They went out of business. You know, maybe the catalog got bought by someone else. They didn't think it was worth holding on to those. So once we pay for the digitising, we get the multi-track, the digitised multi-track, and. Often, I mean, I used to, when I first time I, I did that, I used to get sent a drive. Now you just get sent uh, an upload. You just get a link and you download it, such as uh, things being condensed and internet speeds are faster. So this is, this is Christopher Cross, Ride Like the Wind, um, which was a 48 track. So I've colored these in. They're not, they don't come colored like this. It's just, you just get basically blocks of uh, audio and you can see there, there's, so something like the drums are generally quite continuous. So I'll just solo those. There's the drums. So that's. So I'm generally just at this point going through checking it's all there. So this is loads of stuff. So it's bass. And then lots of guitars, loads of. piano so there's there's he's recorded multiple versions of some of some instruments so you've got to decide which ones you want to use or if you want to use both of them there's the roads there then there's the strings of course which are you know something that like strings I guess they were quite standard on records in the 60s 70s 80s now you don't hear strings very often so if I've got live strings or something like that I'll probably make a much bigger feature of them than maybe they were in the original and then you've got the synth there and the vocals. So there's that bit, sounds a bit like this. So I'll be, I'm just checking generally at this stage that I've got it, everything's here, it's the right version. Sometimes I've been sent things and it's a completely different recording. They obviously re-recorded it later. And this the only version they've got is the earlier version. So, uh, which, Sounds interesting. You think, oh, is it a raw, more underground version? Normally, it's a bit worse. That's the, that's the reality of it. They, they re-recorded it for a reason. So um, it might be, from a train spotter interview, train spotter point of view, it might be quite interesting having that sort of like um, obscure version. But it, for, to do a remix of, you probably want to remix the version which actually came out, which where they actually got it 
as right as they could get it. So I just wanted to explain what the difference is between a multi-track remix and an, an edit, basically. So here's Gladys Knight, Taste a Bit of Love. This is just the original version. So I've just, I've, I always have the original in the computer anyway when I'm doing a remix, so I can go backwards and forwards and just listen to the original compared to mine, just in case I've, you know, there's any levels which I've sort of like, are not, not say not right, but I like to just have it there as a reference. So here's the original. <laughs> Obviously, it's a great record, but I've just got one file there. That's the that's the record, or you could have got it from CD. Doesn't matter where you got it from. It's just one stereo file. So if I'm doing an edit, I can chop this around. I can take this bit and put it here, or I can, if I put this in, into Ableton, I can loop up little bits of it and make it more repetitive. I can do. I can overdub things on top of it once it's in time, maybe add a kick drum, make it heavier, but I can't do anything that isn't featured here. So if the vocals aren't on their own, or if they're not, if the bass drum isn't on its own or whatever, I'm just limited to what they did on the original. But if I should now show you my version, it's done from the multi-track. I've got low, you know, I've got, I don't know, I don't know there's 24 files, so I'd have to count them, but there's, there's you can see, I've got the parts here. So, for example, if I solo these. I can have them on their own if I want, or hit with all the strings. I've got all the individual parts here. So that is the concept of a remix. I'm rebalancing these parts. I'm still using mainly the original parts. So with this mix, I don't think we really overdubbed anything. We used all the original drums, and I mean, it was all very, very well recorded. We didn't need to change the bass drum or change the hand claps or anything. It was all, all kind of like, uh, it was a very well produced record after Ashford and Simpson, I think, and you know, but they were pretty good. But it's, I've got the potential here to really do something completely different because I've got all the con constituent parts separated. Whereas if I'm doing an edit, I've just got that one file and all I can do is really repeat sections and add drums or add space effects. Maybe I could overdub a keyboard solo if there's a part I could put it, but intrinsically, I'm, it's quite limiting. It's not to say there's not people who have done some great edits and you can be creative doing an edit, of course you can. Uh, but there's much more flexibility if you've got all the parts and you can rebalance them. And you know, something like Taste a Bit of Love, it's only got that four minutes, I think it's about four minutes, 12 seconds, I'm not 100% sure, but it's only got the album version. There was never a 12 inch version. So I sometimes think, okay, what would, if Larry Levan had been given this to remix, what would he have done? How would he have approached it? And try and just try and, I hate the term thinking outside the box, but you have got to try and, you, there's so many ways you could put this back together. You could start with just bass and bass drum, or you could just have just those brass things, just the strings, but you don't want to just make it different for the sake of it. You, you got, kind of want to do something that's still intrinsically good, but also different from the original, as well as being playable. I mean, I think for, for my version, there's these intro chords. <laughs> So they're only in for eight bars at the beginning, and they remind me a little bit of another Ashford and Simpson song, Bougie Bougie, and I thought, I, I, I wish there was more of those. So I, I, I made that section go on for a lot longer and put the first verse over that section. So it, it was just a, to make it obviously different, but it was also something which personally for me, I, I like to hear more of that section. So, and then I had a breakdown with just the brass and the strings after the first, cho first chorus, which I thought it reminded me of the sort of thing Walter Gibbons used to do when he used to do remixes and he would have, sometimes I can imagine stuff which maybe the original producer didn't like because he's, he's maybe putting parts on their own which weren't meant to be parts used on their own. They're meant to be sort of in the mix behind the guitars and the roads and he's just like got just the brass and the strings over drums. But some of those things made the records sound a lot more distinctive. They made them sound less like a lot of the other records that were around at the time, which were mixed in a more conventional way. So once I've kind of done this, I've just checked it's all there. The next thing we do 
it's, we put it into the into Ableton, which is a different program. I, I use Logic. This is Logic 9. I normally mix in 10, but Logic uh, is what I use to actually do the remixes. What I can do in Ableton is basically put the multi-track to an even tempo. Though the multi-track at the moment is live, so you know it varies in speed, but if you want to remix something in a modern way and move stuff around, so I want to put the strings from the end near the beginning or move vocals around, it's much, much harder because it's not in time. So you want to be able to make it more DJ friendly. And I know people have said to me in the past, you know, if you warp something and put it to a level tempo, you're not sort of taking the feel out of it. I mean, I think to a degree, yes, you are. But I think if you do it, my experience of doing it with to the multi-track is very different to doing it just to the stereo file. Because when we're doing it to the multi-track, though we might be, we're warping the bass drum. So we're basically, if you look here, all the bass drums have got a marker on them. So, and then that's used as the template for the track. So everything else is getting moved. They'll be all being put on the beat and everything else is getting shifted around. So you've evened out the tempo and then I decide what tempo I want to do it to. I mean, as, as I was saying about maybe straightening things out too much, a lot of disco records were made to a very fixed tempo anyway. So you're not dealing with some free jazz record which you're rigidly sticking to sort of like, a, you know, a 4-4. Four four. These records are often 4-4 four four and they were generally, maybe it might have moved from 114 to 116, but it wasn't a massive shift. So I don't think because of the nature of the original music that we're sort of like altering it in a, in a negative way because the records are already pretty, you know, on the beat. So by doing this warping and putting it to a, a level tempo, yes, we are losing a little bit of feel, but I try to make sure we don't do that any more than we have to. If we only need to do it by bars, we only do it by bars, We keep just to keep it in time. And then it enables me, once I've done this, I, I can then bounce that, put it back into Logic, and then, then I can start messing around. Think, okay, let's see what the horns from the last chorus sound like in the intro. And you can, you can do some much more radical things, which would have been really difficult. You would have had to spice, splice tape, and you know, taken lots of different versions back in the late 70s or the early 80s when they were first doing these tracks to, to achieve the sort of things that we, we can achieve now once the track's been put to a consistent BPM. So I thought I'd show you one of the finished mixes. So this is. Christopher Cross, Ride Like the Wind, the actual mix down. It's been put in Ableton, I've rearranged it. Often I do the rearranging, once it's been put in Ableton and straightened out, I put it on my laptop and I might rearrange it when I'm on the away somewhere, going away or even at home. Sometimes you think it sounds better than it does. When you actually get it in here, you think, oh, actually, it's gonna be quite a lot of work to actually get it to sound good. One thing is a good arrangement, another thing is actually getting the sound sonically so it's, uh, you're happy with it. And that sometimes can be something which can go on for ages. I'll, I'll, we'll mix it, and I normally mix things with engineer Matt Bandy. I, I, I'm not, I don't do it on my own. And I'll keep working on it, and I'll change things, and I'll play it out, and it's, it, it, that bit goes on for months, to be honest with you. It's, not, it's very rare I mix something and that's it. I'm going back and tweaking it, and tweaking it, and tweaking it, both arrangement and sonically, for like, literally years. This, this session, this Christopher Cross session, you can just see how complicated. So this is our buses, you've got vocals, instruments, bass, drums. So that's the buses we're sending all those things to. So, and we bounce quite a lot of these down. That's a kick drum and uh, so that's all drums, more drums. Then you get to the bass, acoustic guitars, electric guitar piano, roads, brass, strings, and the vocals at the bottom. I mean, if I play a bit of this. That actually just uh, freaked out, and one of the one of the reasons 
I'm playing you this one, I actually ended up bouncing this down to stems because this arrangement became so complicated, I actually couldn't work on it anymore. It just, the, the computer, even though I've got a fairly new computer, it was just too much processing information because there's so many audio files. All of these have got automation on them as well. So if I show you the automation, you can see there's lots of volume and uh, effects. Well, you can't actually see from that, but there is, believe me. There's lots of stuff and it just, it got to the point with this one and also the OJ's I Love Music, the arrangement became so complicated, it was almost impossible. You play it and it would keep stopping and, uh, so I ended up having to bounce it down. You have to be fairly happy with it sonically. You bounce it down to stem. So I'm going back to a more basic. So I'll bounce maybe some of the drums, the percussion, the bass, the roads. So I'm going back to maybe 12 tracks. And then once I've gone back down to the smaller amount of tracks, I can then start doing some more radical things, which would take forever on this, especially as the, it, it's under, it, it's a strain on the computer. There's so much happening. So. That's another part of the process. Yeah, I think, well, I've got it kind of okay. I wasn't really happy. This is one which it took me a while to get right. And I just wasn't happy with the arrangement. I wasn't quite happy with it sonically. But once I bounce it to, st I think we got it sounding a bit better. And then once I bounce it to stems, I could then go, you know, start thinking, okay, why not try drag that there, move that there. And I can move the drums without having to, you know, some of these things are cut into really small amounts. So. It's, it can be, especially when there's lots of automation, it's really fiddly moving things around. So um, the stems thing frees you up again and you can start sort of like, uh, it can be a bit more fun like it was when you were first rearranging it, when you just had the parts and you weren't worried about the sound of it when you were just like, before we got to this stage. So this was uh, a multi-track I was really pleased to get. Nicolette Larson, a lot of love, because it's the original's always been a favorite of mine and uh, I thought it'd be a great one to remix. And. Uh, this is this is just the files when I got them. It's just 24 files, and I played it, and uh... that bit always reminds me a little bit of Ivan Elman. If I can't have you, but what was interesting about this one is it's got this. Obviously, the musicians were getting high in the studio. It's produced by Ted Templeman, who produced a lot of the Doobie Brothers stuff. Um, uh, it's a sort of those LA session guys, uh, very good musicians from the late seventies, but I was surprised to find this, this was on one of the tracks. Hey, what do you got in that bag on the wall over there? What do you? Hey man, you break a line, man, break a line. Spoon? Spoon? Oh, oh, wow. But let's try, let's try one time now, let's try. It's, it's gonna, gonna take a lot of drugs to get my child than we are. It's gonna take a lot of drugs. Where's the fucking bar? So it, it sounds like uh, they were definitely having a good time in the studio that night. It's not often you hear like something like that on a multi-track, and especially as it's such, the track's quite a mellow, sort of AOR, soft rock, yacht rock, whatever you want to call it. So uh, and that, that sounds, reminds me of it, the Muppets, an X-rated version of the Muppets. When I was uh, shortlisting uh, the multi-tracks I ideally wanted for a Remix of Love 2, one I really wanted to get was the Pockets Come Go With Me. So I was really chuffed when I sent the list to Sony and it, it was one of the ones that they had the parts for because it's until you actually, they tell you they've got it, you can't assume that it's going to be possible. And um, I got a pile of these songs I paid for the digitising for and I was going through them and the Pockets was one of the first ones I listened to and um, I'll play you a bit of what, what, what I heard uh, now, which anyone who knows this record well will know, spot what's not right. So why don't you come and follow me there? No more troubles, no more pain, no more problems, no more stress and strain. So everybody. Come and go with me. 
mean, basically the music, everything's exactly the same, but it's got a completely different lead vocal, even the lyrics and it's a different singer, but the song's not quite the same. So I thought I can't remix it like that because it's, I mean, I hope the guy's not watching this, but it's not as good as the, the one which actually appeared on the record. And we don't know what the history is. Presumably they delivered that to the label. Maybe the, maybe the singer left the band. Maybe the somebody said, why don't we get so-and-so to sing it instead? But whoever stepped in and replaced the lead vocal um, sounded a lot more convincing than, than this guy. So I was, I was so pleased when they found another reel and they copied it and it was the right one. So that's that's what's i guess we just don't know what the story behind these records were when they originally came out i mean this is 40 years old it, it, it's pretty bloody old anyway so when i was doing uh remix with love i had quite a long period where i was just working on this project and once i completed what i felt was enough of the mixes uh, we started sending them back to the labels for them to be approved which again that can be a very slow process you know it's just getting the right person to listen to it and say, yes, we're okay with this being released. And sometimes you're sending them off the tracks and um, you're checking three weeks later, is there any progress? And they say, oh, can you resend the links? Uh, they haven't downloaded them or, so it's, it, it's, it's a, something that they've got to do, which is probably not top of the priority list. And also I think sometimes they're not sure who actually has to approve these mixes? Because normally when there's a remix commissioned by a major label, somebody's actually commissioned the mix and he's the person who says, yes, I love this mix, we want to release it. Whereas with these mixes, they haven't commissioned them. We've done them, but they have to, someone has to, in the, within the company has to decide that they're okay with them coming out and there's nothing, you know, I haven't put an Adolf Hitler speech over the top of their record or something like that, which is gonna somehow sort of like, um, put, put, put their, their product in uh, ill repute. So, and sometimes they don't approve things. You know, you'll get, you'll send off five to be approved and four of them, they say, yes, no problem. And then one of them, they won't approve it. You know? And you can't often get actual a reason. They'll just say, oh, there's contractual issues with that track. And you just don't know what that is. It might just be that they can't find the contract then if they can't find the contract, they can't be 100% sure they own it, so they won't license it to you. Even though we might have agreed the deal nine months ago before we got the parts, it's um, when it actually comes to signing it, they need to make sure all the paperwork's in place. And if they can't do that, then they just won't, um, they won't license it to you. And there's not really any sort of discussion to be had about it. I'm just gonna play you a little bit. This is a Patrice Russian app remix I did, which was gonna be for Remix with Love 2, but, um, yeah, we couldn't clear it, so uh, I don't know if it'll ever come out. We might try again for the volume three. I'll just play a bit of it now. So yeah, that was quite frustrating because that's actually quite a radical remix with uh, Kaidi Tatum playing keys on it and uh, new bass and everything. But hopefully at some point things will change and we will be able to release it. And I guess the reason I'm doing these sort of remixes is for me, it's a dream come true having listened to lots of these records like hundreds, maybe thousands of times, you know, and especially at a time when I was sort of like, you know, first buying records and the late 70s, early 80s, I dreamt of being able to remix these records. And I thought about, when I when I first got those multi-tracks from Warner Brothers about five years ago, I thought no one's gonna just phone me up and say, oh, do you wanna remix The Pockets Come Go With Me? Or um, do you wanna think of another track on the album? <laughs> but uh, Lonnie Listen Smith, Space Princess, it's never gonna happen. If, if, if you want that to happen, you're gonna have to make it happen yourself. So it's been quite a long, complicated journey 
but it's uh, I suppose it's like the journey of finding a really rare record that you uh, have to you know scour the internet for and go around loads of junk shops it's it's worth it in the end and um, even doing the mixes sometimes it can be quite depressing when you're sort of like trying to get something to sound good and it doesn't sound good and then you listen to the original and you think oh we're never going to better the original but you, you you can do it if you just really set your mind to it I guess it's my dream job really to do to do this you know and to, and and not just to be doing edits to actually get the original parts of these of these songs and um, you know do new versions of them which you know I, I, I'm not one I, who knows what these mixes will be viewed in in context with the original in 20 30 years time I don't know but for now they make the records a little bit more pliable and they're going to get these artistic exposure again who some of which you know have been forgotten about some haven't but and for me as a DJ it's great playing these records in my sets and you know for in 2015 I had loads of these versions my own versions of Gwen McRae and um, other songs which you know which I could play at my gigs and it was like it's a familiar song but not you've never heard this version before so it's it's great ammunition to have at the gigs I mean I, I'm quite lucky to a degree because I was around in the 90s and the decade after so I made a, a bit of money out I had some commercial hits and whatever it's much harder for people starting now to you know, make money out making music, especially this sort of music. It, th these sort of projects are not profitable projects. You know, th there's a lot of expense and, you know, they sell okay, but there's a lot more expense than making money, making music on a laptop. So I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm lucky that I can indulge myself with these sort of projects and, um, and do this sort of stuff where I'm sort of paying multi-tracks to be copied and, you know, with, with quite limited rights you know you're not getting I don't own these records they're still owned by the major labels so um, I hope people enjoy the mixes and I hope you know people who know the originals think oh I quite like that new version and maybe people who've never heard of the pockets or whatever you know get to hear that song and maybe they go and investigate some of their other albums because they made some lots of good stuff it, you know it's it's it's, it's uh, I'm lucky to be able to do it Night.